well it's nearly Easter and in Australia at this time of year in Sydney there's something called the Royal Easter Show. It's a little bit like a huge version of the Bonnie Conlon Show. There's all these competitions for best in show of various breeds of everything you can imagine but also there's show bags being sold and things being demonstrated and sold as well and I remember one year there were these amazing knives. They seemed like the world's sharpest knife. In fact I'm sure the person demonstrating said that's exactly what they were and they really were just cutting through everything and so we bought one and it was very sharp for a little while but the problem is it very quickly showed its cheapness and the sharpness didn't last it was blunt before you know it maybe you've done that with cleaning products you see a demonstration on tv or in person and it is amazing how how this cleaning product is better than everything else on the market because wow look at how easy it is you just spray it on and the mess is gone you just give one little wipe and everything is cleaned up and, and those demonstrations have this way of just sucking us in don't they uh, it would be so good if it was just a matter of just spray your bathroom once and give it one quick wipe and that was it but of course when you but get it home the product never really lives up to the hype well today we're not thinking about in hebrews 9 not thinking about cleaning our bathrooms or our kitchens or our carpets or anything else what we're looking at is the issue of how to cleanse a guilty conscience how is it that we cleanse our guilty consciences and before we jump into looking at what the Bible says, I want to suggest a few different ways that you and I and, and the world around us often tries to tackle this problem. Now, the first is that we compare ourselves to others. We look at the world around us and we usually are not too hard pressed to find someone who's even worse than we are. And so we look down at them and we think, well, I might have made a few mistakes here and there, but at least I'm not as bad as that person. And we use that comparing and, and you know, have you noticed we never compare ourselves to the best examples. We always choose someone who's worse than us and we compare ourselves to them. And our hope is that in doing so, we will cleanse our guilty consciences. Or another technique that we try is the technique of distraction. We fill our lives with enough noise and busyness and activity. And so when someone asks, how have you been? Our answer is invariably, oh, busy, so busy, so much going on. And, and, and we think if we just have enough noise and enough distractions, fill our lives with Netflix, even when we're, we're at home, we just don't have a moment with ourselves, no time to allow that inner voice to rise up and accuse us. And so we think we can just drown out our guilty conscience by filling our lives with distractions. Or another technique we might use is that we seek to punish ourselves. If I'm really harsh with myself, then I don't need to feel guilty anymore. I don't need to worry about any other punishment. I don't need to worry about God punishing me because, well, I'll do it for him. And so, uh, well, it, within religious circles, there's been the idea of self-denial, of, of even flagellation, which is this idea of physically hurting yourself in response to your own sin. And of course, even the way we treat things like fasting and prayer and, and our religious activities and doing penance, uh, we can use that as a way of saying, well, if I've done something wrong, I'll take it on myself to deny myself, to punish myself, to feel constantly guilty about it, to constantly beat myself up on it, about it. And then if I've done that enough, then that can remove my guilty conscience for me, surely. And perhaps on the positive side of things, we try to be good. We try to be charitable. We try to be more devout, more religious. I've, I've met someone uh, here in Balaná who, who goes to mass every single day. And the reason they do that is not out of mere, merely because of devotion or loving it or enjoying it. As I spoke to them, it became clear to me that the reason they were so committed was because they were so gripped by their own guilty conscience. And so they thought, if I'm religious enough, if I'm devout enough, if I go often enough, then this will make amends for the deep guilt I feel. This will remove it for me. Or it might be that you do it by trying to outweigh, well, here's my guilty sins. And 
if I can just put more on my good account by being charitable, by being generous, by getting involved in lots of volunteering, by sending out lots of, lots of love and gifts and presents and, and uh, activities of devotion to the world around me. And then in the end, if I can just concentrate enough on that, then the guilt will go away and that will remove my guilty conscience. We seek peace with God through all these different ways. We seek inner peace with ourselves. But Hebrews chapter 9 points us to a different way, a better way. In fact, the only true way that we sinners can fix, can cleanse, can remove the guilt that we carry. So let's first read from Hebrews chapter 9 verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. It's funny that he ends by saying, we can't really speak about these things, but he's just spoken about them a little bit. So why does he mention them? Why does this section start talking about the old covenant? In the book of Hebrews so far, we've seen that the writer is at pains to show us that Jesus is better in every way. And so he constantly compares to the old covenant and he says, but Jesus is better. So why does he bother going into the details of what the tabernacle was like, the tent in which God's presence was there manifest amongst his people? Well, it's because it really was the gold standard. It was the gold standard for relationship with God and for dealing with God's people's problem of sin, of, of a guilty conscience. It was the best that was on offer. And yet, we see, it does not truly deal with our problem. It was the best that was there, and yet it was limited. It didn't really deal with our problem. Have a look in verse 6. These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself, and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Did you notice the but in verse 7, the word but? But. See, this old way may have been the gold standard, the best on offer before Jesus came, but it did not open the way into the holy place. That but in verse 7 makes it clear that it did not perfect the consciences of the person who came to worship God. The but makes it clear that it only deals with external things and could not fix our biggest problem, our heart problem. And notice not just the word but, but the word until. Until. See, something better was coming. We saw that last week, that the, t the tabernacle and then the temple that followed were built to match something that was bigger and better. They were built to specifications that matched the heavenly reality. It's like uh, the com comedy movie, uh, Derek Zoolander, Zoolander. He's, he's promised that this center will be built in his name, that it will be the center for children who can't read good. And he's shown what he thinks is the real thing. Obviously, it's just a model on a table. And he says, 
what is this? A center for ants? Because it's ridiculously small. He says it needs to be at least three times bigger than this. And that's a picture of what the tabernacle was like. It was just a model. It was there as the gold standard, very good, but just a model. It pointed forward. And so that word until that appears here tells us that yes, the tabernacle and then the temple that followed was the gold standard, but it was just a model, just a shadow of the things to come. But in verse 11 through to 14, we have this better hope placed before us. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that, will he, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We have a better hope. We have only one way to have our consciences cleansed. And here the writer says, well, it could never be through the sacrifice of heifers, of goats, of sheep. The fulfillment we're told here is through Jesus himself. He doesn't enter a copy, a little model temple. He doesn't offer a pointer forward, a placeholder sacrifice. He's the one and only final sacrifice. On the cross, he died though he was innocent. The Son of God came and died on that cross as our one and only sacrifice. All of the anger that we deserve, all of our guilt and our shame, all of it was placed on Jesus. And he bore it all on that cross. He, he's the only one who can take our guilty consciences and cleanse them because he's the only one that can pay the price for our sins. And so the question needs to be asked, well, was the old covenant dodgy? If it all relied on Jesus, well, why was it there? Well, it, no, it wasn't dodgy. It was just incomplete. There wasn't something inherently wrong about it. Rather, it was just not yet complete. Verse 15 makes it clear that though they sacrificed bulls and goats, it was the death of Jesus that still lay ahead of them that would redeem them by paying the price for their guilt and transgressions. All the Old Testament believers, all those who loved and turned to God, well, their actions weren't futile. There was a reason that they still needed to offer these sacrifices. It showed their guilt before God. It showed their sinfulness and it it relied on not the actual blood of the, the bulls and the sheep and the goats being shed. It pointed forward to when the real sacrifice would be made. It relied on Jesus. They, though they didn't know it, were relying on Jesus' sacrifice. For he alone can pay the price for our guilt, for our transgressions, for our sin. The point is this. Having our guilty consciences cleansed, is not a mere feeling. Lots of people these days might say things like, well, I really made peace with God. I feel at peace. I'm, I, I'm at peace with my decisions. I'm at peace with how I'm living. And friends, that's not the most important bit of how, how you and I feel. F feelings come and go. It's not about how we feel. It's about whether our guilt has been dealt with. It's not about us doing something to feel less guilty, to feel better. The only way we can have our guilty consciences cleansed is if our real guilt is actually dealt with. I'll say that again. It's not just about feelings. We need our guilt dealt with. There's a famous old story by an American author 
called Edgar Allan Poe. Now, I could say I'm very cultured to know about this, but the reality is I first learned about this story by watching The Simpsons on TV because it's quoted in, in one of those, one of the episodes of The Simpsons kind of is based on this story. Um, but it's the, called The Telltale Heart. And the context of it is that the, the narrator of the story has murdered someone. He's guilty. There's real guilt there. And, and he's buried the body of his victim underneath the floorboards in his house. And he receives a visit from the Garda, from the police uh, to investigate. And he's trying to hide his guilt. And it speaks to us about this idea of dealing with a guilty conscience. Let me read from it. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chatted of familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definiteness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. It grew louder, 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 and still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard, they suspected, they knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now again, hark, louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked. Dissemble no more. I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of this hideous heart. His guilty conscience sold him out. So sometimes people I think are very good at burying their guilty conscience. Let's not get good at just hiding our guilt, burying it under the floorboards. And conversely, sometimes, even once the guilt has been dealt with, even as we've come to Jesus and we've become followers of his, we've confessed our sins and laid them on him, even once we do that, well, we allow ourselves to be deceived into having a guilty conscience again. Those past sins revisit us. They nag us from below the floorboards. We, we haven't really let them go. And so what should we do if we are haunted by the beating of the hideous heart of our past sins? Well, verse 24 tells us what we need to do. Verse 24 tells us this. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Friends, we need to remind ourselves of what is true right now. And that is that if we were to look up and tear open the skies, to move the clouds away and to look into heaven right now, then for everyone who belongs to Jesus, for every one of us who has put their faith in his death and believes that he has risen again as our Lord, as our King, as our Saviour, then we, we, if we were to look into heaven, we would see that right now he intercedes for you and for me. He has paid the price for our sins and now he doesn't point a finger of condemnation. Rather, he pleads our case in the very throne room before the Father above. That is the reality. And so if you're plagued with the, the guilty conscience of past sins, remind yourself that they are paid in full, that Christ's death was enough, and that right now you have a high priest, a king, a savior, one who loves you and knows you, one who knows your deepest, darkest secrets, and who instead of condemning, he lives and pleads and intercedes for you even now. To carry that guilt, 
is to look at the cross and hear Jesus's cry of it is finished and say, yeah, not really, Jesus. I still need to carry my share. I still need to do my bit. I still need to somehow pay back the price you've paid. We needed his death, but his death has paid the price in full. And so friends, turn to Jesus for the first time. If that's you, you've never seen your need for his salvation, turn to him today. And for, for those of us who have put their trust in Christ and yet sometimes are plagued by our sin and our guilt, let's remind ourselves that it is finished. He has paid the price and we are free now to live for him. We're going to finish with the song, Thank You, Jesus. And uh, I, I hope that it's a prayer that you can pray. And then afterwards, uh, please join us for Zoom uh, as we spend some more time praying for each other's needs. Let me close this part of our service by praying for us now. Father, thank you that in Hebrews 9, we are given the real way to deal with our guilty consciences, not through distraction, not through comparing ourselves to others, not through being charitable and trying to outweigh our sins with good deeds, and not through punishing ourselves, but through Christ alone. He deals with our guilty consciences because he took our guilt away. In him we are forgiven and righteous. We are yours forever. And that is good news. So we sing his praises now. In Jesus' name. Amen.